for half a century, WJPZ Syracuse has been the greatest media classroom on the planet. We've trained students from the 1970s to the 2020s on how to run a professional radio station. But the lessons learned and relationships formed go far beyond studios and transmitters. Taking a look back through the eyes of those who experienced it. This is WJPZ at 50. Welcome to WJPZ at 50. I am John J. Gay. Today's going to be a good one. We have another Hall of Famer on the podcast today from the class of 1986, Mr. Dan O'Wolkoff. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thrilled to be here. And I appreciate uh, you inviting me on. You know, when you get old, like I am, you think everyone forgets about you. So I'm just happy. Happy people still remember and I'm, I'm still alive. So that's good. <laughs> well, I will say that I speak on behalf of many alumni when we say we'll never forget you, your contributions to the radio station, both as a student and as an alum. But before we get into all that, because we do have a lot of ground to cover today, Dano, start at the beginning. How'd you end up at Syracuse and how'd you end up at JPZ? So I ended up at Syracuse because a friend of mine and I took a road trip the summer before we graduated high school. Syracuse was not on my list. I actually wanted to go see BU and go to the broadcasting school at BU. I had no idea about Syracuse and Newhouse and none of that. We stopped there because he wanted to go pre-med. Mm -hmm. So we stopped at Rochester and Syracuse on our way out to the East Coast of like Boston and uh, Georgetown. And I can't remember the other stop. So the reason we stopped there was because he wanted to see the pre-med. I ended up saying, well, that's interesting. They have this communication school. I'm going to go check it out. Uh -huh. And I walked in and I got a tour and immediately they walked us through uh, back then Newhouse 1 and 2, but 2 had all the studios in it, the television studios. And again, this is back in the 80s. So the fact that they had a huge studio and they had three cameras and, you know, on the wheels and looked like a regular broadcast facility, I said, wow, this is really kind of cool. I better check this out further. So we came back, I got the literature, I checked it out. And it turns out like, wow, Syracuse really does have a fantastic communication school and Newhouse is well known and well respected. And I just decided after seeing BU and, you know, in the environment in the land, I said, you know, Syracuse seemed like a good fit. So I went early decision. I got in early decision into Newhouse and I didn't even apply anywhere else. Once I got in, I was like, all right, well, that's done. I want to do anything. <laughs> so I picked them. They picked me. It worked out great. And I was thrilled to end up you know, going there. All right. So when you get to the campus, how did uh, you end up finding out about JPZ? So JPZ came about because my freshman year, I lived in Marion. And at that point, this is before they redid the studios in Watson. There was the original studios they put into uh, Watson after they wrecked Spectrum. So the original JPZ studios were in Spectrum, I think by freshman year and then sophomore year, they wrecked that building. So they moved JPZ over to uh, Watson Theater and, and they carved right. out a little area for them in UUTV back then. Mm -hmm. My hallmate, his name was Alpo and he was doing a radio show. He said, why don't you come over and we'll do a show together and be Alpo and Dano. And so once a week, we got an <laughs> afternoon show. And again, remember, this is before FM. So we were just on a, you know, common carrier uh, signal that went into all the dorms. Uh, yep. I don't even know if the AM was broadcasting at the point. Yeah, you know, hung out and it did a three hour shift. I think it was like Wednesday afternoons or something like that. That's how I started at the station. Then they decided to go through the whole being licensed. So when they wanted to get the FM station up and running, they made everyone take the test to get an FCC broadcast license. Right, right. Okay. I think I have mine somewhere, but what's funny, we took the test and then I think they finally decided like, well, technically we don't need to have an FCC broadcast license when we finally went on the air. But we all took the test. I got certified. And in all honesty, I really don't know how I ended up getting picked for the mornings. I mean, Alpo was not going to do the show anymore. I was just looking to do a shift and they came back and... Uh, at the time, I don't know if it was Larry Barron. I don't remember. It could have been Dave Levin. Whoever it is, picked a bunch of us just to do morning show and be part of this morning zoo. And they say, hey, we want you to do, uh, be uh, one of the people on the morning zoo. And I go, really? And they go, yeah. I go, okay. Because you went from just being a regular jock shift to, to morning. Yeah. And I didn't think I was that funny, by the way. So I, I'm like, <laughs> you know, you scratch your head and say, like, I guess I could do that. So they paired us up. And I think I started with Monday and Wednesdays, and I think Fridays were optionals. And then the other morning crew was Tuesday and Thursdays, and Fridays was optional. Okay. I think I showed up Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. I think I was always there 7 to 10 on those days. 
And, you know, we interacted. Uh, Happy Dave Dwyer, you know, was there. Uh, Danny Class, Danny the K was there. EWR was there. So a lot of these guys, and they were doing, you know, either EWR did sports. We had news people. I mean, we're doing the whole thing. But our core group was Danny and Happy Dave and myself. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how we got started and, you know, started to have some fun. And then semesters changed and my schedule changed where basically I was only taking courses on Tuesdays and Thursdays (laughs) and pretty much like from 10 o'clock on, right? I had nothing on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and I had to get up on Tuesday and Thursdays anyway. So I started showing up every day. Every day I was just showing up. Yeah, no one cared. Like, no one said, like, you can't do that. No one said, like, hey, not fair. And, you know, I do a couple bits and we do a couple breaks and we talk and we joke and laugh and just make fun of people and whatever it was. And that's kind of how it ended. And and it kind of really took off. I mean, the morning show, the original, you know, crazy morning crew, once it hit the airwaves, I mean, it was crazy. The amount of people that knew about it, not only on campus, but when we would go out anywhere, like in the city to a restaurant or something. And it came up, they would say, oh my God, I listen to you guys all the time. So it was really, yeah. it was kind of cool. It was kind of cool to see it start. It was great to be at the beginning. And, you know, I guess I was just on every day. So everyone kind of knew like, oh, I hear you. Yeah, well, if you listen anytime, yeah, I'm on. So you're going to hear me. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Okay. So you do the morning show and at some point you have to graduate. So you do that. (laughs) And then you have had an incredible career since graduation. Uh, Walk me through it as best you can, starting with where you were after Syracuse. So let's be clear. I went to Syracuse, not for radio. So this was the sidebar, right? This was just like, no, this is kind of fun. This is interesting. I mean, I love listening to radio growing up. I mean, in Cleveland, we had great radio stations going back to AM, you know, Wixie 1260 was a heritage AM station. I grew up listening to big, big top 40 station on the AM. Now on the FM side, they had G98 and M105. And of course, the one that everyone knows is WMMS, Yeah, you know, which is just the huge call letters, you know, growing up and listening to, you know, the morning show there as well. So I love listening to radio. I thought it was fun to listen to. I never thought I wanted to be on air. Uh, And that just kind of worked out as kind of a hobby and just an escapism, you know, so to speak, that we had some fun and was, it was, I enjoyed, got me up in the morning. Quite frankly, if I didn't do radio, I probably would have slept all day. It quite literally got you up in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, literally. And when I say got up, I mean, we started at seven and I roll in at, you know, like seven, I could hear the break on the radio coming, right? They, you know, the overnight just ended and they're kicking it to the morning show and it's 7.01 and they're doing top of the hour news. And I got two minutes and I literally walk in and then, you know, the mic just turns on. We just start talking. I mean, I, that's how quickly we, we cut it. But that was my wake up call. So I went to Syracuse for television and graduated with uh, TRF production. Back then we call it producing for the electronic media. Mm-hmm. And my goal was to go into television and uh, write, produce, direct television commercials. That's all I cared about. That's what I pretty much majored in, took all my coursework. And the only thing I did at radio was JPZ and, and hung out at the station. I moved to New York right after I graduated and uh, my wife, I was already engaged. She already had a job working for Macy's back then Bambergers uh, in New Jersey. So we were already located there and I had to find a job. I went to every network television. So ABC, NBC, CBS, by the way, there was no Fox back then. So right, right, right. Yeah. Those are the three networks you could apply to. And all of them said, you're welcome to come. You could be an intern, um, but they're not paid. So you can go work. And not only was I flat broke, I was in debt you know, up to my ears. And I looked at them, I said, I love it, but I got to have a job. So long story short, before I left, I was in Professor Breyer's office as I was walking out and saying, hey, I'm moving to New York. If you hear anything, let me know. He basically, as we were talking, said, great. You know, I don't know about anything right now, but give me your number. And just then the phone rang and he goes, hang on a second. And he talks to this fellow for a couple minutes and writes down a name and a number and hangs up the phone. He goes, hey, I know this isn't TV, this is radio, but if you're interested, there's a syndication company, a network in New York City, you're moving there, you may wanna check them out. And I said, great. And so he writes down a name and a number, and literally, I, I kid you not, I didn't even look at it. I took it, I folded up the paper, I put it in my wallet, and I left. That was the end of it. Didn't ask any questions, nothing. And go to New York, find out I'm not getting a job anywhere, at least not a paid job. And I got to find work. I, I got to go you know, make a living. And I finally remember, I go, oh my God. I go, I remember he gave me this company, radio, I don't know. So I pull out the piece of paper. It says MJI Broadcast 
and has a number to call. And a, a guy to ask for his name was Eric Sheffield. Well, it turns out Eric Sheffield graduated the year before I did back in 85. Okay. He did not work at the radio station. I think he was in TRF management, ended up working at MJI. It, the company was in its fourth or fifth year starting to grow and they were looking to hire. And uh, the job that was available was literally, you know, working in affidavits clearance, like so collecting <laughs> affidavits. Back then they had card readers, right? This is, a, you, I know I never remember this. You used to fill out, you know, little circles on a card and put them through a card reader. And that's how you fill out your affidavit. It's basically the spots from the network ran on these stations at these times, right? Correct. Correct. And there were little bubbles that you filled in. So you, I, my whole job every day was scanning these cards Oof. and then generating a report. That was what I did in a back office when I started at MJI. So that's how I got in. That's, that was my start was just luckily I, I called. And by the way, when I went for the interview, here's a great tip. So, you know, for people who are listening and you're going for interviews, uh, they asked me, so, you know, what do you see yourself doing in five years? And remember, I'm talking to a network radio company and I say in five years, oh, I see myself in television doing television commercials, <laughs> right? Needless to say, I didn't get a call back, you know, and I, I'm like, look at like, really? I can't get a call back. And I had a call back to the, um, with the COO and I said, Hey, I haven't heard from you. And I said, yeah, well, we're feeling like you kind of aren't really into radio, that television's your thing. And of course I did the, oh no, 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 yeah. I love radio. And yeah, I could be doing TV in five years, but radio is my first love and I'd love to be in there. And so I begged for the job. I literally had to come in and beg to get the job. And they gave me a chance. They go, okay, we'll give you a chance. So that's how I got started. And I worked my way up from, you know, doing affidavit and clearance into affiliate relations and into sales. And then, you know, you know, overseeing the sales department, you know, for them. And again, these were affiliate relations, you know, adding affiliates to all of our programmings and stuff. And so I did that for a good solid uh, six, seven years. And then uh, my wife and I, who were married at that point, started to have kids and decided we want to raise our family back in Cleveland. So we basically said, hey, it's been great. I'm moving back to Cleveland and you know, I'll have to go find another job. And they're like, look at me, like, what do you mean? And I go like, I, you know, I'm not raising my family here. Yeah. I'm going to go to Cleveland and, and I'll have to find another job. And at that point, you know, the internet just kind of kicking in, you can connect computers. And I said, I'm going to open a regional office. And they said, listen, that would be great. Can you go to Chicago? And I said, no, the point of moving was to go back. <laughs> what year is this, Dano? This is 92. Okay. So I was with uh, NGI from 86 through 92. Mm -hmm. Long story short, I put together a proposal. I said, hey, we can open up these regional offices and have people all across the country versus everyone under one roof in New York. And so I finally convinced them to let me go back to Cleveland. And they gave me a six month trial. I said, you go back to Cleveland, open up the office, figure out how to make it work. The only thing we're going to pay for is your phones and a fax machine because <laughs> fax machine just coming into state at that point. And other than that, you got to rent your own office or work from home or you got to figure out the rest. Wow. Yeah, you're on your own. So listen, better than not having a job. And so we moved back. I start working. Long story short on this one is my sales went up by like 500% because <laughs> I'm there. I'm in Cleveland, right? I don't have to like fly to Cleveland and talk. I'm living in Cleveland. I'm calling on stations. Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Detroit. I could drive to these people and one day I could see 10 radio stations in a day, have all these meetings and get stuff done. So they realized this is a good plan. And so they put me in charge of all the outside offices and we just began to open offices across the country. So we opened up LA next. So I flew out to LA. I got that office set up. And they hired people out there. Did same thing with Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta, Nashville. I mean, all the big cities. And I basically was overseeing all these offices that were now operating outside of the New York, you know, hub. And and that's what I did with them all the way up until the company sold and uh, got bought by Premier. So I ended up moving on and working with Premier, mm -hmm. and I did that for three years. And we consolidated, you know, MGI Broadcasting and Premier, and, and everything went under the Premier umbrella. And it was a good run for a couple of years, but, you know, I got tired of, you know, basically having to clear Rush Limbaugh. And uh, <laughs> to me, it just wasn't appealing. You know, MJI was entrepreneurial. 
you know, we developed programming, we listened to the marketplace, you know, we created stuff, we built it from the ground up. It was very exciting, very innovative. And I love that. And nothing wrong with Premiere. So people who work at Premiere and people are listening. I love you guys. It's great. <laughs> they, they made it quite clear they were just going to buy, you know, companies like MGI and other companies and, and, and amass it. They weren't going to ever build anything from the ground up. Everything was going to start you know, even Rush Limbaugh was on the air years before, you know, Premier took it over. Because you might say the same thing about other companies that were bought by that same larger company. Correct. Even in podcasting now, that same company is doing that. Exactly right. And again, that's business. That's how it goes. But again, this became an aha moment for me. So when, when I realized that that's all that Premier was going to do and that my time was really, you know, going to be up there, they're not going to, you know, we're merging all the departments, right? The last one there, turn off the, the light switch is basically how that goes. Yeah. So as my time wound down there, I made the decision along with my wife that we would go out and start Envision. And the goal here was literally to go back to the original days of MJI, right? We would find producers who had programs that wanted to syndicate or had ideas they wanted to bring to the market. And we really specialized in my background, which was affiliate uh, relations, affiliate sales. So as I said, if you, you know, had a good idea, we can absolutely you know, build a network, or at least we could say we can get you on station. So the goal was, is if you had a good idea, we'll get you on a station or two. If you have a great idea, right, we'll build a network. Okay. And that's how we started. We started, you know, to syndicate a couple of shows and services. You know, one was a, a prep service and everyone laughed at me and said, are you insane? There's so many prep services. I said, yeah, but this is better. Which one was that? Uh, it was originally called Bid Exchange and is now called The Rooster. And Mike Marino, a guy based out of LA uh, who never took my phone call, never would meet with me, nothing. And he started it. And when I started Envision, I called him up and said, um, hey, I got my own company now and you never met with me with the other one, but maybe we can help each other. And he finally met me for, you know, lunch out in LA somewhere. And, uh, and he said, all right, let's do this. So we kicked off with, uh, you know, his prep service. We had a couple of long form weekend programs. And the most important thing that we did was a guest booking service. So when I left Mayor, there was a group of us that uh, worked on this guest booking service. We provide morning show guests for radio stations. Okay. The satellite tours, you know, so basically celebrities would come in, they talk to 10 stations via satellite and there'd be like 10 minutes each and, and that would be the whole tour. And so they let go of that whole uh, division. And uh, when I started Envision, we hired back that whole division. Oh, wow. Yeah, started right where they left off and affiliated the same 25 major market stations we had before. And that kind of was the foundation all the way. It's still to this day, it still goes on. I mean, the service still exists. So you're talking 20 years later, providing guests for morning shows, which we started way back when is still around to this day. But that was really kind of the cornerstone for what we did at Envision and always look for just innovative ideas. So for 17 years, that's what we did. My wife and I ran the company. So working with your wife is a very interesting dynamic. It freaked out a lot of people because we would not go into meetings introducing, hey, meet my wife. You know, we went in as separate individual. She was COO. Uh, you know, I was president CEO. Yeah. Until we really got further along, we started talking about personal life and kids and, you know, oh, you have three kids? Yeah. And how many kids do you have? I have three kids. You know, yeah. So it took a while for that dynamic to get in there. We go full disclosure, just so you know, we're married. When we say three kids, it's the same three kids. <laughs> There's not more of us. It's the same ones. So and it's been great. And to this day, we're still working together on some projects because eventually Envision, we did sell. It got bought by Gen Media Networks a couple of years ago, and we got merged in with some broadcast group. Um, so we became part of the management team at Sun. We did that for about a year and a half and decided it was best to uh, part ways. Mm -hmm. And so we did. We kind of you know, retired, so to speak, and are now focusing more on a renewable energy. So if you need a charging station in your place of business, let me know. We're really good at doing that right now. So what is the company you're, you're at right now? The company that we're at is called Tandem 3. We are consulting for companies that are looking to place electric chargers in their parking lots. Wow. And I can't take credit for it. Our daughter, who we moved from New Jersey when we decided to move back to Cleveland, that was why she was born. And then we had another one on the way. She uh, started her own company. And their goal is to put chargers in fast food restaurant parking lots. So the idea is- Love it. Right? You go to Taco Bell, 
You want to go get your chalupa, right? You plug in, you walk in, go to the restroom, eat a chalupa, get something to drink. 15 minutes later, right? You have another 100, 150 miles of charge on your vehicle and you're off to the races to wherever you're heading to next. So that's their goal. And you're doing something with audio too. You're not completely out of audio, right? No. So the other company that we broke off when we sold Envision was called Happy Land, Happy Land World. We do do audio focused in mostly on converting podcasts into audiobooks. Okay. The goal here is people who create the serial podcast or have done podcast on a certain theme, we've been able to figure out how to take those podcast episodes, turn them into chapters of books, and now we create audiobooks that can be sold and distributed on a whole nother platform worldwide. Love it. Especially as the podcast guy. I love it. <laughs> It's the podcast celebrating the world's greatest media classroom. It's WJPZ at 50. Hey, JPZers, it's Sam Candell, class of 2018 and chair of this year's Banquet Committee. Banquet 38 will be March 4th, 2023, and time is running out to get your tickets. You can buy tickets now for $125 through February 28th. Get them now through the link in our show notes. Looking back at half a century of broadcast excellence. This is WJPZ at 50. I want to come back to what you said about when you started Envision and taking the group that was no longer needed or so they thought at Premier and bringing that in. And then also working with these affiliates and radio stations and major marks you had worked with um, at MGI at Premier. I feel like the lesson here is relationships and that relationships are everything. And I think any JPZ alum would tell you that, but you have that real firsthand experience, Dano, of being able to leverage those relationships that you spent a long time cultivated and building to grow your own business when you started your own business. You make an excellent point. And when I was inducted into the JPC Hall of Fame, which again, I'm very proud of, because again, so many people have come through that uh, radio station and are in the industry and literally are icons of the industry. So the fact that I'm even in the same group with them is is impressive to at least myself, (laughs) not so much my family, but at least for me. (laughs) And uh, the takeaway from that that is I gave a speech about then, you know, LinkedIn was just coming onto the scene, you know, and was really kind of taken off, you know, about 10 years ago. And I was trying to explain to everyone how important networking is, right? And finding ways to connect and make those relationships, you know, whether you were at school at the same time with these people or you're in the business and going to conventions and, you know, you just got to understand how to work the room. You really got to be able to go out and meet people and talk and communicate. Jay, you've done a fantastic job of that. I see you out and about all the time. And thank you. And I think that that's something, you know, some people have it naturally. Others have to kind of learn and be taught it. But networking is key. Going back to your original question, when we kind of took this group of three people that were booking guests for morning shows. And again, we started them in an office in New York City in a shared office space. I did that while I was on vacation uh, with my family in Vegas. You know, we took the kids to Vegas to, you know, see it and then went on to Palm Springs. Not that I'm a huge gambler or anything, but uh, back then they were making it family friendly. So we... uh, There are air quotes there, by the way. Family friendly, yes. Yeah, air quotes. (laughs) Family friendly. Yeah, right. So we did this all, you know, on the fly and found a place for them to go to and move in. And so we had that kind of New York office even before we had a Cleveland office set up. They kept booking guests and I called the stations and said, hey, just so you know, I know they premiere announced that this is ending and I just want to let you know that we're going to keep it going and keep it booking. But when I said we, I never really kind of, you know, said we meaning envision or Hmm. we, I just said we, the collective, we are going to keep it going. And uh, funny enough, you know, we signed, I think there was 25 affiliates. We signed 21 of the 25 to new contracts. The contracts clearly read it was Envision, but I don't think anyone paid a lot of attention to it. The fine print. And they really just thought that the service was just continuing. Like it was just a new variation of the service that they were using before, which it was. Wow. Okay. What was never really disclosed was, right, that it's a completely separate company. You know, everyone just saw, you know, and heard Dano, right? And so they just assume that it's just Dano. Dano from, you know, MJI. Dano from Premier. It's just Dano. And these are people that I knew and they trusted me. And there wasn't a lot of questions after. They just said, great, we love the service. Send a new contract. We'll sign. We'll keep going. Wow. And that's how it kind of went. So 
we kind of came in under the radar. And mind you, some of these were, you know, back then, these are iHeart stations. So these were Clear Channel stations, right? Because Clear Channel owned Premier right. and they were supposed to be using only their own services. This is back when, you know, you're not supposed to use outside companies. And so we kind of didn't draw a lot of attention to it. And I think it helped with the fact that I had very strong relationships and people weren't questioning, who are you? What are you doing? It's Dano. So we know it's going to be good, right? It's going to work. I got to imagine that's a lesson you started to learn at JPZ. What other lessons do you feel like you've taken with you throughout your career that you learned at Z89 or well, I guess at the time JPZ? Yeah. Yeah. The greatest classroom in the entire world. I mean, it is. Yeah. And my biggest takeaway from there is, yeah, I know it sounds trite, but how to play nice with others. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it was a lot of personalities, a lot of people, you know, not happy for whatever reason, because, you know, they didn't get the air shift they wanted, you know, that they had to pay their dues or they didn't become music director or they weren't named the program. You know, there was always some angst, you know, that was going on. And so even with us doing the mornings, right, you had to learn that, you know, you can't hog the mic, like you can't talk every break, that you can't <laughs> do it all. And for someone who's just there having fun, like you always want to be on and do something, but you realize like, you know what? It's okay. I'm going to sit out you know, the next couple of breaks. Let these guys do it. They got a bit. They got something they want to do. They want to talk about. If you need help, holler. I'll pick up a mic. If not, go do your thing. And, and so that really kind of, you know, I think guided me and, and allowed me to understand that you're going to be dealing with a lot of personalities when you get out in the world and a lot of things are going to happen in business. And as you can imagine, you know, particularly in radio, lots of egos, lots of ego driven, oh, yeah. you know, people get fired for no other reasons because of their ego. Right. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. open. so I think my biggest takeaway was just the ability to learn, to get along with others, understand you don't have to be right all the time. I had a very sarcastic, biting, you know, a sense of humor. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, you got to watch it. I mean, you just got to be careful yeah. who you, what you say to who and how it gets taken. And fortunately, I, I think I was able to read the room and not use it in the wrong situations. But, you know, in the right situations, obviously, it's a huge asset. I wish I could go back and put a dog shot collar on my 18, 19 and 20 year old self and zap myself every time I said something I shouldn't have said. <laughs> so your point is certainly well taken. Yes, exactly. I think we all want to. What are some of the relationships that you've taken with you, uh, whether it was your classmates or other alums that have really, you know, grown over the years, Dano? Again, and that's what I love most about JPZ is the relationships. You know, again, you know, two gentlemen, you know, Alpo, I talked about another guy named uh, Ted Lambrinos. We all worked at the station. We all kind of did our separate things, you know, and, and they were both a year ahead of me. So they graduated in 85 uh, and I was there, you know, 86 without them. Uh, but to this day, very good friends. Um, we go on vacations together. Our kids are all friends. They all vacation together. Wow. And when we all got married, we're all in each other's you know, weddings. So those are lifelong relationships. And it's amazing when I think back about it, all because we were connected through this radio station. So that to me is thrilling. People like Happy Dave and, you know, Danny Class and all that. I mean, you know, we don't talk on a regular basis. LinkedIn, we do all send messages occasionally. Happy birthday. What's going on? But, you know, the fact that, you know, I see them pop up every so often and we get to see each other, you know, at a reunion is just fantastic. And we all start to laugh, you know, with all the good stuff that we remember being back on the air. And then other relationships like, you know, Rocco Macri and Chris Bungo. Yeah. Those two, uh, I love to death. When I started Envision, they took a chance on our company. Uh, we worked with them on one of their you know, new products that they were rolling out. They were kind enough to give us a shot. We had very little success. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, it just wasn't, <laughs> it, it wasn't a good fit for us because it was technology based and all of our salespeople were more radio based, right? It was a really, and this is where, you know, the merging of technology and, and bringing in and, but they stuck by us and I, I'll never forget that, right? They could have easily said, you know, we had a, a year long contract or something and they could easily turn to us and said like, you know what, Dan, oh, this isn't working after the few months and we're out and they did, they stuck by, they wanted to see it work. We worked together. And since then we've been lifelong friends and, and we knew each other at the station, but we just didn't do a lot together. Rocco was kind of more into the, you know, marketing stuff. Chris was more into the production stuff. And other than, you know, see him in like the production studio, Chris and I really did the very little together, you know, except wave at each other. Yeah. But that's another lifelong relationship that came out of there. Uh, Mary Mancini, Dave Levin, uh, we, we really 
didn't know each other at JPZ. I mean, my long running joke about Mary is that when we were on air and we would always break format and play records that we shouldn't play or break them out of rotation because again, you know, I wasn't good at following rules. So I would just, you know, they said, it's gotta be a blue. And I said, I want to play a yellow. You know, it was just, you know, <laughs> you know, however the wheel won. It served Mary well when she opened that record store in Nashville, though. <laughs> exactly right. So the joke was, as they said, you know, you're going to get in trouble with Mary. And I, I don't even know who Mary is. You know, tell Mary come in, you know, and I get you know angry about it. I, I, I tell you what, if Mary comes in here, if she can kick my ass, then I'll start following. You know? So there was this ongoing, I don't think Mary ever heard it. And when I saw her at a reunion, I told her like how everyone feared Mary. And I just said, like, I don't care about Mary, whatever and all. And she started laughing. She like told us, she goes, that's so funny. She was like, yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like that wasn't a thing. Like it was. Oh my God. It was like created. Like Mary would be upset and Mary like, I don't I care less what record saw you played and all that stuff. So <laughs> we have a great time. We get together at the reunion. And then Rusty, Rob Burrell, even more recently, Corey Crockett, Kevin Rich, Alex Silverman, uh, Josh Wolf, Matt Friedman. These are all people I did not go to school with. They were good 10, 15 years, you know, after I was there and we met at the reunions and we have this kind of relationship. Dad, you're another one. It's just like, I feel yeah. like I know you. Likewise. You know, outside, not at the reunion. If you we were, you know, if I was in Detroit and going to a game or something, I saw you we'd stop and talk for like, you know, a half hour. Like it's just. I have a beer together. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, it's just incredible. And I, I just, I love the fact that that connection just keeps getting bigger and bigger and people get more and more involved in, and hopefully, you know, the students that are coming out understand and realize that it's just something that you're going to have the rest of your life. And with that passion that you clearly have for the radio station, the alumni, Daniel, you may have seen a sign at one point in history, the Envision Radio Network studio. You <laughs> have been extremely generous with your time and financially as well to the radio station. Talk to me a little bit about that piece of it and what it meant to be a position where you could give back to the station. Yeah, I feel very blessed and fortunate. And, um, uh, you know, the timing was just right for everything. I mean, Envision was turning 10 years old. Uh, we were coming off a fantastic year. Um, we wanted to do like a big blowout celebration and toot our, our own horn and, you know, Envision's 10 years old and a you know, big party. And, and what year was this? This would have been a 2012, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The 2012, 2013 would be, we would have been 10 years old. So everyone's giving me ideas and plans of what to do. And we could do a huge party and be great and the industry and all that stuff. And then I saw that uh, JPZ was, you know, basically building new studios and they were putting stuff together and, and they started to reach out to the alumni and see if we can raise some money and, and the university put up some bucks and, and they were just hoping that, you know, we can kick in something. And so uh, I think Corey was started it. And then uh, Elizabeth. Liz Doyon. Yes, Liz Doyon. Yes, exactly. It came in, so they changed GMs. And so those two kind of got with the university and we figured out like, hey, we want to make a donation. I don't want to do a party. Let's just donate some money and let it go for the studio and buy the equipment. And so it was great. I thought it was a good idea. It was a warm and fuzzy. It made me feel good. It made my wife feel good. It was you know, just a great way to give back and to something that really has impacted our, our lives and not just you know from a business standpoint, but again, you know, Rocco and Chris and Mary and Dave and Alpo and Ted and these people are friends of my family, right? These are family. Yeah. Now this just isn't that. So, you know, I think about that and I say, you know, we need to do something to continue and to help this, you know, go further. And so, you know, donating money for the new studio just seemed like a natural fit. Now, an interesting story out of this was not so easy to donate money directly to the radio station. Oh, because of see, the Syracuse University bureaucracy or? And it turns out that you can't just, you know, donate the studio because it's a building, it's a structure and the structure is owned by the university. Therefore, it's like a classroom. It's like a mm -hmm. building, right? They have certain guidelines that you have to follow. And it, it was a whole to do. And I was saying, we got to figure out something else. So what we decided to do, we weren't going to donate the studio, that the money could be used for equipment, not a problem, and that we were going to just basically, you know, donate the airspace that everyone was going to work in. <laughs> okay. So that's why, you know, I don't know if they still do it. They used to say, you know, broadcasting from, you know, the, you know, Vision Radio Network studio or something like that. So it wasn't the studio itself. It wasn't the hard walls. It wasn't the four walls. 
but they were broadcasting and that's why they could say it on the air as well. We're broadcasting from, you know, the, the virtual. You were quite literally on the air. On the air, correct. And the university people like went along with it. I'm not going to hear this and come back and say, you can't do that. But they, they agreed to it. They said, you actually, you have a point. You actually could do that. So that's what we did and made it work. That's the ingenuity of a business owner right there, Thanks. figuring out a way to make something work when told no, finding a yes. Absolutely. Yeah. No is when the sale begins, right? That's what they say. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'm going to use that <laughs> in my business. Last question for you, Dano. Any funny stories you can think of from back in the day that you still look back on and laugh over a beer at Fagan's when you come back? Oh, my God. You know, I got to just tell you, like every time, you know, I went into the studio, which again, as I said, was on a daily basis. I mean, I would go in probably, you know, hungover. Or I would go in like I just woke up, like I'm tired or just not in a good mood. And then every day I'd walk out there with a huge smile because we would laugh. I mean, we would just laugh, you know, for the whole time that we were together on the air because we were just having so much fun. And, and it was just you know, stupid stuff. It could be as silly as, you know, a story. It could be as, you know, Danny the K, you know, making fun of uh, Morris Day and doing his impersonation, which sounded nothing like him, but made me laugh or, you know, <laughs> Happy Dave, you know, just, you know, screwing up a break or whatever it was. And we were just, you know, it, it was just fun. You know, a bunch of guys, you know, ragging on each other, which was always interesting. So one story in particular, um, I'll give you two. One, one we did a, a live remote and we just got these wireless microphones. And we went downtown and we went to like the central bus stop, which was in downtown Syracuse, which by the way, <laughs> back then, no one went to downtown Syracuse. I mean, that was right. the thing that you did. And we said, let's just do this. It'll be kind of fun. We'll go out on the street. It'll be kind of like, let's meet the people and you know, the people are drive. <laughs> so we, we did the man on the street. I had the microphone, I'm talking to people. And, and one of the people I talked to got on the bus. And I, I wanted to continue the conversation. And I said, I got on the bus, right? And so- <laughs> And so we're talking and the doors of the bus closed, right? And, you know, now I'm like, I, I, you know, illegally on the bus. I didn't pay to get on the bus. I just walked onto the bus with the other guy and I didn't give <laughs> care. And the bus takes off and it goes down the street. So I'm still listening you know, with my headphones because we're broadcasting. And, and I'm saying like, I wonder when this will cut out. And, and they're laughing and saying like, yeah, like you're like now two blocks away and it's still going. So we're good, like thousand yards or something like that. Finally, it, it just, you know, static just came. They're laughing. I, got, I think we lost Dan. Oh, I guess we'll see him tomorrow, whatever the button. Oh, my God. So it was very funny. It was just a piece of radio that, again, you couldn't think of. We didn't dream up. Yeah, it was just spur of the moment, you know, that, you know, something like that happened. It made for some, I wish I had the hair check of it. It made for some really fun radio going down. You said you had two stories, a second story? The station finally goes on the air, right? Big hoopla. If you haven't seen the documentary, you know, that Scotty put together for us. You, everyone should watch it. it basically the, the history of the station, but the, how it got on the FM dial and, and started. So anyways, station launches, huge party, huge celebration. Everything is great. Everything's running great. Technically, we didn't know if it would work. It did work, right? And all the guys in the background, you know, Fox, you know, who's the engineer, you know, figured it all out. And the dumbest thing that they did is there was this huge box, which was obviously, you know, transmitting to the top of Day Hall, to the top of Mount Olympus. And it was a, a microwave dish, right, that would pick it up and then it would go out and be broadcast across all of Syracuse. But there was a little button on this little panel mm -hmm. and it basically, they put a big, huge do not touch, right? The big, this is the button in the studio, do not touch, but no explanation, no nothing, other than <laughs> do not touch this. And so, uh, you know, I would be in the control room and I see it and I start asking questions. I go, why can't we touch that button? Like who said we can't touch the button? What will happen if we touch the button? And so happy days look at me and say, he goes, I, I think that takes us <laughs> off here. I go, that is the dumbest thing. Are you saying if I push this button, you're going to take this basement off the air? <laughs> <laughs> and he's saying, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen. I go, I, I just don't believe it. And Danny's saying, oh, that puts the button. I said, well, I go, but I don't want to like be responsible. And the, so this is going on for like five minutes. And so finally I get the point, I'm going to push the button. I'm going to push the button. They go, don't push the button. I go, I'm going to do it. And so I push the button and the station goes off the air. <laughs> 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 so, the, you know, so the engineer comes running in. People are screaming. We're off the air. Who did it? Who did it? And I, of course, me look over, I go, I didn't do it. Happy to. And he's like, everyone's pointing at each other. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> so, so needless to say, 
After that, they moved it and that button no longer was there in the studio. Like they finally realized like, why do they even have that visible for anyone to even push? Like that was a dumb idea. Why would you put a do not press this button button in the middle of a morning yeah. show? You guys, you guys had great instincts for bits even back then. Exactly right. So, you know, again, that was to me, it was it's funny because it was it went on for a long time. And, and finally, I just said, like, screw it, I'm pushing the button because I want to know what's going to happen. I mean, I'm like a two year old, right? It's like. Don't touch that. I got to touch it now because you said don't touch it. Throughout this podcast, we've seen how similar personalities we all are throughout 50 years of this radio station, whether you graduated in 75, 85, 95, 05, 15, or 25 now, I guess. But that is all of us listening right now going, I would have pushed the button. I know I would have. <laughs> you know, now, you know, everything's computerized and all that. So yeah, I guess you really do still kind of push a button somewhere. You click a mouse, I guess is more of the thing that happens now. But back then it was lots of buttons, lots of dials, lots of buttons, lots of pods, lots of there were always things to be. So the fact that there was a button that you couldn't push was very tempting. They're like, we got to push that button. Dano, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your contributions as both a staffer and as an alum. And we really appreciate everything. We'll see you in March. And with that, I'm going to go push this button right here. <laughs> Don't push that button. No. The WJPZ at 50 podcast is created entirely by the staff and alumni of the world's greatest media classroom. It's hosted by John Jag Gay, class of 2002. Editing help from James Bames Grundy III, class of 2020. Imaging by Maureen Cooper, class of 1999. And Ed Lacombe, class of 1985. Podcast artwork by Marty Dundix, class of 2001. Follow WJPZ at 50 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now.